Let us now look at some more uses of the normal equation. So first a reminder as to what we had done. We had looked at the column space of a matrix A, meaning we had taken vectors and put them into a matrix A as columns, and looked at the way of separating out a vector B into a parallel component, a component in the column space of A, and an orthogonal component, a component in the null space of A transpose. And we found that an efficient way to compute these is to use the normal equation to simply take AX equals B and multiply through by A transpose. That the parallel component then was A times X, where X is a solution of the normal equation. And there were a couple of special cases that we had considered where this equation really simplifies and the solution is trivial to write down. So today we're going to use the normal equation to first find matrices that do these projections. The projection of B onto B parallel, onto the column space of A, and the projection of B to get B orthogonal, the projection of B onto the null space of A transpose. The second big application today is that we're going to use the normal equation to find orthonormal bases. So let's start. Orthogonal projection matrices first. The orthogonal projection onto a span of vectors, A1, A2 through AN, is solved by putting those vectors into a matrix as columns and computing the normal equation and computing A times X, where X is a solution of the normal equation. There are a few points to make here. First, the normal equation by itself can have an infinite number of solutions. After all, the null space of A transpose A is the same as the null space of A. And if A has linearly dependent columns, we know that we have a homogeneous solution. And therefore, we could have an infinite number of solutions, A transpose A, X equals A transpose. And those solutions differ from each other by homogeneous solutions. So if I get such a solution, x is equal to a particular solution plus a homogeneous solution, I have an infinite number of solutions, but of course the right-hand side, ax, I mean, when I compute the parallel piece, that right-hand side is unique. a applied to xp plus xh, well, distributes over that sum, and so axh is zero, I get axp, a unique solution. The other point to make here is that the normal equation has a unique solution if and only if the vectors AI are linearly independent. So if the vectors AI form a basis for the span of those vectors A1, A2, AN. The other point to realize is that if those vectors are linearly independent, A transpose A will have a pivot in every column and A transpose A is square. And as a consequence, that means that A transpose A is invertible. If that were not the case, if the vectors were linearly dependent, well, we can always remove the dependent vectors till we whittle everything down to a set of linearly independent vectors, A1 through AN, and use those. So we'd have a basis for RS as the first step, and then we can do our computation. So let us use this observation to solve the normal equation. Specifically, what I have is if I take a matrix A made up of linearly independent columns, so it has full column rank, then A transpose A is invertible. And therefore, if I look at my normal equation, A transpose A is invertible, I can immediately solve for X. X is the inverse of A transpose A times the right-hand side, A transpose B. And when I now take that solution to compute the projection of B onto the column space of A, B parallel, it's equal to A times that solution X it's equal to a matrix applied to B, the matrix A times the inverse of A transpose A times A transpose. Similarly, the orthogonal component of B, B minus B parallel, well, B parallel, we just said is a matrix times B, and plugging that in and factoring, we see that it's another matrix, I minus that matrix P times B. So what we've just done is we found a matrix P this complicated expression, and a matrix I minus P that project B onto their respective spaces. Namely, P projects the vector B orthogonally onto the column space of A, and I minus P projects the vector B orthogonally onto the orthogonal complement of the column space of A, namely onto the null space of A transpose. Let's formulate that as a theorem. 
If I give myself n linearly independent vectors, a1 through a n, I write them into a matrix A as columns, then I can find the orthogonal projection matrix onto the span of those vectors, onto that hyperplane, by computing this expression A, the inverse of A transpose A times A transpose. And similarly, I can obtain the orthogonal projection matrix onto the orthogonal complement of that span by computing I minus that matrix. As an example, let's consider orthogonal projection onto a span of three vectors. So here, I've got three vectors, 1, 5, 1, 2, 3, 3, minus 1, 2, and 4, 8, 0, 4. And I'll use those vectors to decompose B into a component in the span of these vectors, plus an orthogonal component. So the first step is to simply write this as a matrix equation and obtain the normal equation. The thing to notice is that third vector A3 is actually simply the sum of A1 and A2. In other words, my vectors here are not linearly independent. So to use that formula, to use the that inverse of A transpose A, I have to first remove linearly dependent vectors. Now, I can remove A3, that only leaves me with A1, A2, and putting those into a matrix, now I've got a matrix that has linearly independent columns, I compute A transpose A, it's a square matrix of size 2 by 2, it has an inverse, and this lets me now compute the orthogonal projection matrices, namely the projection matrix into the column space of A, into the span of my original three vectors, is A times the inverse of A transpose A, so A times this matrix here, times A transpose. And when you multiply all of that out, you get this 4 by 4 matrix that will compute the projection for us. The orthogonal projection onto the orthogonal space to the span of S is given by computing I minus that parallel piece. And when you subtract the parallel off of I, you get this matrix here. The orthogonal projections then, if I want to use them, uh, on my vector B, I take my vector B, I apply B parallel to it, and I get this vector. The orthogonal component, I take the vector B and I apply the second matrix, the P orthogonal matrix to it, and I get this vector over here. And that's the same result that we had found previously for that matrix. But let's quickly check orthogonality. 14 plus 22 plus 0 minus 3 times 12 indeed adds up to zero. So the dot product is zero, those vectors are orthogonal. Just as before with a normal equation, when we found that special cases greatly simplified that equation, similarly, the computation for the projection matrices is also greatly simplified. So let's start with the example of the orthogonal projection onto a single line. So what we have is our matrix A now consists of just one column, and we can exploit that and look at the figure first. Remember how we did this? We found that the parallel vector had to lie along the vector A and therefore had to be some multiple times A. And the perpendicular vector is just B minus that parallel vector. We wrote this out and we had to compute the dot product of that equation, alpha A plus that orthogonal piece equal to B taking the dot product with a, reduce the equation to a dot ax is equal to a dot b. Now a dot b, I can think of as a transpose times b, although a transpose b is a matrix of size one by one, so I'll just put this into a matrix, and therefore a times a dot b works out to a times a transpose times b. And thus, x is equal to 1 over the length of a squared a dot b, as before. And the parallel piece, b parallel, is equal to a times x is equal to 1 over the length of a quantity squared times this expression here, a times a transpose, the column a times the row of a. An equivalent way of doing this computation is to simply use the normal equation directly. p parallel is equal to matrix a the column A vector, times A transpose A inverse, times A transpose. And A transpose A inverse, since that's just A dot A, is 1 divided by A dot A as a 1 by 1 matrix, 
and that's trivial to multiply out. And again, we get one over a dot a times a a transpose. As an example of the computation, consider the vector three four zero and decompose b into a piece along this vector plus an orthogonal piece. So the projection matrix is the vector a three four four zero times the row vector a three four zero divided by the length of the vector a squared, 9 plus 16 equals 25. And so we get the matrix 1 over 25, 9, 12, 0, 12, 16, 0, 0, 0, 0. The orthogonal projection matrix is I minus the parallel matrix is the result that we get over here. Using it is the same as before. The parallel projection matrix applied to B gives me the piece that is along the vector A. And yes, 12, 16 are indeed a multiple of uh, 3 and 4, namely a multiple of 4 fifths times that vector. And the orthogonal piece is the orthogonal projection matrix applied to B minus 12, 9, 2. And when you check the dot product, the dot product is indeed 0. Those vectors are orthogonal. And if you check whether or not they add up to B, they still add up to B. The second set of formula that we'd found is things greatly simplified when we had an orthogonal basis. And so let's see what happens to the projection matrix in this case. We have A transpose AX is equal to A transpose B, and we multiply through by the inverse. Since the vectors are orthogonal, A transpose A is diagonal, and its inverse, therefore, is 1 divided by each of the diagonal terms. So 1 divided by the length of A1 squared, length of A2 squared, all the way to the length of AN quantity squared. And now I have a diagonal matrix multiplying A transpose B. I can multiply that out. And so what I get is a sum of terms of the form 1 over AI dot AI times AI I transpose namely the same form that I had for a single vector before. Now that the other vectors are all orthogonal to each other, my projection matrix simply becomes a sum of such terms. So for mutually orthogonal vectors, the projection matrix becomes a sum, a projection onto the first vector onto AI, an orthogonal projection onto A1, an orthogonal projection onto A2, and the sum of these projection matrices is the overall projection matrix into the comb space of A. This particular form that it decomposes in that sum crucially depends on the vectors to be orthogonal. As an example of this computation, consider the vectors that we had seen before, A1, A2, A3, which are mutually orthogonal. Each vector has a length of 9 and compute the orthogonal projection matrices onto first onto A1. So onto A1, it's A1 times the transpose of A1 divided by the length squared, 1 over 81 squared, and the appropriate multiple of A1 times A1 transpose works out to this expression. Here. This is the orthogonal projection matrix onto the line described by the span of A1. Similarly, the orthogonal projection matrix onto the span described by A2, the orthogonal projection matrix onto the span described by A3. Now that we have the individual projection matrices, we can compute the projection matrices onto spans of these vectors. And so, for example, project onto the span of A1, A2, onto the plane formed by the A1 and A2 vector. That will be the sum of the projection onto the A1 vector plus the projection matrix onto the A2 vector. So the projection onto the span of A1, A2 is just the sum of projection matrix onto A1 plus the orthogonal projection matrix onto A2. And here, this is the expression that we get. An exercise that you should do is to simply consider what happens if I sum all three of these. What should be the result? Why should I expect that result? Since we have seen that orthogonal vectors are really useful, let's investigate those some more. Let's start with an example again, just to refresh our memories. I have three vectors here, and it's easy to see that they're mutually orthogonal in unit length. And what we'll do with them is we'll write them into a matrix, and we verify orthonormality by simply computing A transpose A. And so what we expect to see on the diagonal is the length of the first vector squared, 
1, length of the second vector squared, 1, length of the last vector squared, we see i. The consequence, therefore, is that this A transpose A matrix that that multiplies out to i is that the inverse of A is A transpose, since A is squared. And another comment is, and therefore we know that the A1, A2, A3, there's three vectors that are linearly independent, that are mutually orthogonal in R3, that therefore form an orthonormal basis for R3. Well, we now have matrices that uh, multiply out to I, so let's make that a definition. A matrix A is, unfortunately, the word is not orthonormal the way you would expect, but orthogonal. A matrix A is orthogonal if and only if the transpose of A is equal to A inverse, that is, if and only if A transpose A multiplies out to I. For complex numbers, I just want you to have heard the term used in the complex case, namely a matrix A is unitary if and only if, well, we don't just need the transpose, we also need the complex conjugate. So AH, the Hermitian transpose in uh, complex numbers is the take A transpose and take the complex conjugate of all the entries of A transpose, that matrix. Since the matrix A is square and the columns are mutually orthogonal and unit length, that's why A transpose A multiplies out to I, that's why I have the inverse being the transpose. These matrices have important properties, namely if I apply an orthogonal matrix to a vector, it doesn't change the length of the vector. And if I apply it to two vectors, it doesn't change the angle between the two vectors. And as a consequence, numerically, multiplying by an orthogonal matrix is extremely nice. It guarantees that computations can't overflow. It guarantees that numerically they're as benign as I can make them. So here's the theorem. An orthogonal matrix traditionally is called Q. So Q is an orthogonal matrix, and let X and Y be vectors with a consistent number of entries, so my multiplication worked out, and the length of QX is the same as the length of X, so the lengths are conserved. Similarly, if I take X and Y and I compute the dot product, and therefore I have the cosine of the two entries, I see that that angle is conserved, that the dot product between QX and QY is the same as the dot product between x and y. The special case, of course, is if x and y are orthogonal, then qx and qy are also orthogonal. A quick example to that effect, here is a matrix Q. It's not an orthogonal matrix because I missed two columns here. But if you check, the column vectors are indeed orthogonal, and I'm giving myself two orthogonal vectors here, a vector 1, 2, and a vector minus 2, 1. If we check what happens with these computations, if I compute Q transpose Q to verify that the columns of Q are orthonormal, I indeed get the I matrix, and so Q indeed has orthonormal columns. That Q matrix, however, is not square, so it doesn't have an inverse. In fact, if I compute Q Q transpose, I get this matrix here. There is no inverse here. The fact that it's got this nice pattern is simply because I chose very nice entries for my columns in Q. Let's verify the lengths and vector properties. So x dot y is equal to zero, so I know that x is orthogonal to y. The length of x is one plus four is five, so square root of five. And q times x works out to this vector here, and when we compute the length of q times x, indeed, it is square root of five. So if I multiply by a matrix with orthonormal columns, the length of the vector x does not change. The angle, similarly, if I compute qx and qy and take the dot product, then what I get is these two vectors and their dot product is zero, just the way it was before. So x and y are orthogonal, then qx and qy are also orthogonal. Of course, what I could do with that matrix Q is I could augment it. I could add orthonormal basis for the transpose of Q to make this a full matrix, and then Q, Q transpose, and Q transpose Q both multiply out to I. I now have a matrix that is invertible, and its inverse is equal to the transpose of Q. Now, since orthonormal uh, vectors are so useful, we want to see if we could take a set of vectors that form a basis for some hyperplane in Rn, 
and somehow or other construct an orthogonal basis for that same hyperplane. So if I think of i and j, two orthogonal vectors for a plane inside of R3, and some arbitrary basis for that plane, I would like to take that arbitrary basis and somehow or other make, straighten it out, make it orthogonal and unit length. So the idea, it goes as follows. Look at the figure first. I have three vectors, a vector v1 in blue, a vector v2 in red, and a vector v3, the brown vector over here. They're linearly independent, so together they span R3. I have three vectors in R3 that form the basis for R3. They're not orthogonal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly build up an orthogonal set of vectors. Keep v1, and I get the line in blue as any multiple of v1. Now for v2, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take V2 and together with V1 that defines a plane inside of R3, I'm going to get that V2 and decompose it into a piece that is parallel to the blue line and orthogonal to the blue line. So I'm going to keep that orthogonal vector. And the thing to notice is that this orthogonal vector W2 is now orthogonal to V1, that together they define that same plane, so the span of V1, V2 is the same as the span of V1, W2, but now those two vectors, V1 and W2, form a basis for that plane that is orthogonal. For the V3 vector, I'll repeat the same steps. I'll split the V3 into a piece that lies in the plane and a piece that is orthogonal to the plane, and since the span stays the same if I take V1, W2 and this orthogonal piece, I'm going to use that orthogonal vector for the third vector. So the equations are that I start with V1, I'll keep it, I'll call that W1, and the span of W1 is the same as the span of V1, is still that blue line. Then for the second vector, I'm going to replace W2 by the orthogonal piece. So I'll take V2 and subtract off the orthogonal projection into the span of V1 onto that original red line of V2, and that gives me the orthogonal vector, W2. It still spans the same plane, the same plane as V1, V2. Adding V3 in the same way, we are going to decompose V3 into a piece along the span of V1, V2 in that plane, plus the orthogonal piece. So V3 minus that orthogonal projection gives me my third vector. And indeed, the spans of the Ws are equal to the spans of the Vs as I go. So I have to compute a lot of orthogonal projections onto v1, v2, v3, onto those arbitrary vectors, that means solving the normal equation and no zeros in a transpose a. So we can refine this a little bit. What we can do is we can realize the following. I have v1, and now once I compute w2 from it, I now have an orthogonal basis for v1, w2. I have an orthogonal basis for that plane. So rather than using V1 and V2 to form the orthogonal projection for V3, I'll use V1 and W2 to perform that projection. And those vectors are orthogonal, and therefore my projection matrix simplifies. Everything falls apart. So what we get is the following set of equations. W1 is equal to V1. We keep the blue line. For W2, we want V2 minus the orthogonal projection, but not onto V1, onto W1 happens to be V1 for the single equation case, but the idea is to keep the Ws. So I get the projection formula that falls apart, the simplified one, V2 minus V2 dot W1 over W1 dot W1 in the W1 direction. For W3, I get V3 minus the orthogonal projection onto, well, onto the Ws. And so I get the simplified formula, V3 minus v3 dot w1 over w1 dot w1 in the w1 direction minus v3 dot w2 over w2 dot w2 in the w2 direction. And you can keep going for vk. It's vk minus the orthogonal projection of vk onto the w. So it's going to be vk minus vk dot w1 over w1 dot w1 in the w1 direction minus vk dot w2 over w2 dot w2 in the w2 direction minus each time i add a vector i get one more term in the projection 
And then to complete that procedure, I'm going to make the W vectors unit lengths. So I'll take my WIs and I'll divide out the length of WI. That is going to give me orthogonal vectors of unit lengths that span the same space as the original vectors. So let's look at an example. Consider these three vectors, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and minus 1, 1, minus 1. I made them simple so that the arithmetic is easy. The first step, choose w1 equal to v1. So here's my vector. w1 dot w1 will need, multiplies out to 3, and the unit length, therefore, is 1 over w1 dot w1 square root of, so 1 over square root of 3 times the w1 vector. I got my i vector. For the next equation, I'm going to have to compute w2 is equal to v2 minus some scale factor on w1, v2 dot w1 over w1 dot w1 in the w1 direction. So it's equal to v2 minus w1, and then multiplied by v2 dot w1. Actually, I see v2 here, I see w1 here, so v2 dot w1, the dot product of these two, turns out to be 1, divided by w1 dot w1, divided by the length of w1, divided by 3, and therefore it multiplies out to this vector over here. And finally, we need to scale to unit length, and so we have to compute w2 dot w2, the length of w2 squared, and divide it out. Now for W3Q3, the pattern repeats, and listen to my mantra here, that's why I'm remembering the indices. W3 is equal to V3 minus V3 dot W1 over W1 dot W1 in the W1 direction, minus V3 dot W2 over W2 dot W2 in the W2 direction. So copy them down. V3 minus a quotient times W1 minus a quotient times W2. The denominators, uh, w1 dot w1, w2 dot w2, but over here, for example, is w2 dot w2, it's 5 divided by 3. And the numerators, v3 dot w1. Well, we have w1, it's actually sitting right here. v3 sits here, so v3 dotted with w1 works out to be minus 1. v3 dotted with w2 works out to be 7 thirds, which gets cancelled with that 5 thirds that we had before. And adding up my vectors now, I get the vector minus 1, minus 2, minus 1, 2 times 1 fifth. I scale it to Q3 as 1 over the square root of 10 times my third vector. So what I've just done is I've obtained a vector Q1, a vector Q2, a vector Q3. They're unit length, they're orthogonal, and they span the exact same space as V1, V2, V3, a hyperplane inside of R4. Our takeaway for this time around is that we've taken the normal equation and we've done two things with it. One is we've computed the projection matrices. And the projection matrix is simply solving the normal equation by using the inverse and then multiplying by A. So I don't remember that formula the way it stands. I write down the normal equation and apply the inverse. And the point that we had was that that matrix simplifies for the special cases. So if A, if my matrix A has just a single column in it, the form is A, A transpose and uh, scale out the lengths. If my columns are orthogonal, then I get a sum of such terms. And if on top of it, my vectors are orthonormal, then it simplifies even more Then P is just a Q, Q transpose and the sum of QQ transpose terms. And the big application we had of this projection is the Gram-Schmidt procedure, which essentially went to start with V1, called it W1. Then for the next vector, W2, you take V2, you subtract out the orthogonal projection of the span over the previous vectors. For W3, it's V3 minus the orthogonal projection onto the span of the previous vectors W. For WK, it's VK minus the orthogonal projection onto the span of the previous vectors here. And in terms of memorizing these, if you want to, rather than deriving them, my little mantra here, V3 minus V3 dot W1 over W1 dot W1 in the W1 direction minus, etc.
Finally, we normalize each one of the vectors. Uh, so we take W1, divide out the length of W1 to make it a unit vector. W2, make W2 into a unit vector. All the way to WK, make WK into a unit vector. And now I've got my Orson normal basis for the same space, for the same span as the Vs. The Qs now also span that same hyperplane. I have an IJK type coordinate system.